What you're looking at right now is a visualization of the nearly 5,000 papers that were submitted to iClear just in the last week. Now, iClear is one of the biggest conferences and most well known for machine learning. And the reason that we can see all of these is because all of the papers that were submitted are now up for open review. So these haven't been reviewed or anything yet, but I thought even before they're reviewed and we have to you know, wait until the 2023 conference, it might be fun to just sort of take a look through this map of papers. Um, and we're just gonna go over this at a really high level. What you'll see is that if we go to each of these points, they are separated by color and they're sort of positioned such that papers that are on similar topics or talk about similar things are going to be close to each other and are going to have the same colors. I always love visualizations like this. And kudos, by the way, I was someone on Reddit, Nomic, Nomic AI, uh, that made this map using this, uh, what, whatever this tool is. Really cool. Uh, so what you'll see is if we mouse over these, for example, this brown cluster right here, we can see that this topic is standard GANs, or sorry, GNNs, which would be graph neural networks. So if we mouse over, oh no, so there, there's some other things in here, but most of these are about GNNs. And then if we mouse over them, we can also th see things like the title, um, the abstract, if I expand that, and, and so on. And, Obviously, we're not going to be going over every uh, one of these papers. There's nearly 5,000 of them, <laughs> but I haven't looked at too many of these myself yet. So I thought it'd be fun for the first time to uh, when I'm going to see them go over them uh, and just sort of talk about them, maybe go over my thought process of how I keep up with papers uh, and also just see what's interesting, what's going on. Uh, now, as we go through this, I'm not going to like look at every category, right? There's, there's way too many. We can open up over here. There's, I think, yeah, there's a legend and you can see there are plenty of topics and I'm sure this doesn't even capture everything, uh, but I thought it would be fun, you know, um, just to go through the ones that I'm personally interested in, uh, some of the topics that other people have been very hyped about us. Uh, for example, Facebook recently based their, uh, what was it? Make a video where you can turn an image or text into a video. I think that's probably somewhere in here. Maybe we'll find that, uh, but that's the general idea. So if that sounds interesting, tag along, we're going to be looking over a few papers, uh, mostly just the, the overall stuff. I'm going to be saying my thoughts and maybe we'll dive a little bit deeper into some things I'm particularly interested in. Anyway, that is the idea. Now, one more thing I'll mention is if you like this type of thing, consider subscribing to the channel. I talk about a whole lot of big ideas in machine learning, some smaller ideas to, uh, you know, introduce you to new ideas, kind of like what we're doing right now. Uh, and I also have a Twitter if you want to follow me there. You know, I'll post stuff like this when I find interesting papers or, you know, shower thoughts and whatnot. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into it. Let's let's start down here. As I said, I haven't really looked in this into this too much yet. So, you know, I'm in for a bit of a surprise myself here. Um, so let's start off with, with this red cluster. What's this? This is, oh, protein sequences. That's actually interesting. Let me see if I can zoom in here. I can, kind of. I can zoom in a little bit. Protein sequences. So this is interesting. I wonder if there was just this much protein sequencing as in the past, or if this has grown a lot since AlphaFold came out. So let's see, what, 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 I actually have no clue what's going on in protein sequencing. What, what do they talk about? Improving protein interactions using pre-trained structures, oh, using graph neural networks, exploring the chemical space for, oh, I lost it. 3D molecular generation. Okay. Um, hmm. Interesting stuff. I, I feel like I shouldn't be here for too long because I can't really speak to any of this. Maybe we'll go through like the outer bounds of this first and then we'll kind of work our way inwards. That might be fun. So next we have this orange cluster of fairness constraints. Okay, so fairness would be, I guess, like fairness in AI and ML. So, you know, I feel like fairness is a really loaded topic. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. You know, these are clearly, it looks like each one of these papers are on very different topics. Um, but anyway, uh, cool. So we have some gray stuff over here. So banded algorithms. Okay, so banded algorithms is like, if you haven't heard of this before, this is in reinforcement learning. It's like, a, it's kind of a very, what's it called? Like removing all the superfluous stuff and getting down to a very simple situation where you have an agent that has to take one of several actions um, and learn how to most like optimally, you know, what action is going to give it the best reward over time. Uh, so, or expected reward, I guess. An empirical study of neural contextual bandit algorithms. Okay, so oh, graph neural bandits. I feel like most bandit papers tend to be uh, very theory based. So I'm not the most interested in those because I'm not a super hardcore theory person. You know, adversarial attacks on adversarial bandits. So, <laughs> so this is like a security threat paper. Interesting. Yeah. See, this is something that's getting really in the in the weeds here. I mean, I guess that's what you get when you go looking at papers, right? <laughs> uh, that's that's probably exactly what I should expect. Reproducible bandits. Okay. Um, so down here, it looks like there's quite a mix of things. Uh, so there's a quite a mix of colors, but apparently these papers are similar. So, oh, 
MARL, so that's uh, Marolet's multi-agent reinforcement learning. This red is treatment effect. We have MDPs. Uh, what else is there? Intrinsic reward. Okay, so it looks like when we're getting what we're getting down here is mainly RL papers. So this is what I'm personally the most interested in. RL is my sort of area, or it's within my area of work, or rather it encompasses my area of work. So maybe we'll spend a little bit of time down here seeing if there's anything new. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll try and look through a bit more down here. And if I, I find anything, I'll stop and, and show you all. So it's like green is offline reinforcement learning. Purple is MDPs, which is like the, the problem framework or the mathematical like decision process of how you set this up. Intrinsic reward is blue. I quite like, or I'm quite interested in intrinsic reward for those of you who haven't heard of this. This is essentially the idea that you might have an agent uh, that, you know, reward is kind of sometimes sparse or hard to get. It might be optimal uh, to actually have the agent come up with some of its own uh, rewards or some of its own sub goals, and that might help it learn. What else is there? Pink is ReLU networks. Okay, <laughs> uh, that, that seems a bit unrelated. Yeah, so let's, let's take a look through a few of these. So here's one. I wonder if this is interesting. The title kind of caught my eye here. Energy-based predictive representation for reinforcement learning. I'm, I'm a sucker for some representation learning stuff. I, I think that's probably one of the most important areas, not just in representation learning, but I've been arguing the whole field of ML. Um, and I've been seeing a, quite a bit of energy-based work recently, which is essentially, it's not necessarily an alternative to generative models, but can perform some similar tasks uh, or, or fulfill some of the similar uh, problem needs. And essentially what happens in an energy-based model, and I, I wish I could draw this right now, but you have like an X and a Y, and then you have a model that will tell you how essentially like how well those two, the X and the Y match, right? Um, so if you have multimodal sort of data, maybe you have like text and image data, which has been very popular recently, an energy model might tell you like how well text matches a certain image or something like that. And you can imagine in reinforcement learning where you're trying to maybe have an agent do different sorts of things and it has different sorts of multimodal data. I could, I could see something like that being very useful. Let's, let's see what they do. So the TLDR, maybe we'll just do the TLDRs. Propose a novel predictive state representation with energy-based models that shows superior performance on POM DPs. And this is a partially observable Markov decision process. So where the agent doesn't have the full information of the environment, which I, I think is the more interesting case, right? Uh, because that's that's kind of how the real world is. So, so that's cool. But how do they use the energy-based framework? Okay, so I, I guess we can only get so much from the abstract here. And I should say, we, we really aren't going to be diving too deep into any specific papers because there's over 5,000. But th this does sound interesting. I, I just quickly read over the abstracts. The idea is that they're using uh, some sort of energy-based predictive representation. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what that means, but maybe some sort of like self-supervised or some, some sort of non-fully supervised uh, learning uh, features. And then those features uh, are used for like learning, exploration, and planning um, in a way that is maybe more not as direct as just straight back propagation, uh, which which sounds interesting. This is definitely going into my reading list. I'll, I'll check this out. And also anything that that catches my eye and sounds interesting to me, I'll also post a link to it in the description of this video. Though do note that <laughs> I'm not actually looking at the papers before I post these, so some of these might be complete duds. I've definitely seen a couple papers already where I sounds interesting. I click on it and it's like uh, four pages of nonsense. <laughs> some some bad some bad stuff gets submitted to these conferences sometimes. Okay, let's keep going though and see if we find anything else good. Wow, there are a lot of multi-agent reinforcement learning things going on. I will say I, I think multi-agent reinforcement learning ha definitely has a place in the future of just helping agents learn. If you think about it, lots of the reason that the environment is very complex, if you've seen the, the reward hypothesis, uh, the, the essentially the idea that if you have a very co or a complicated enough environment, uh, then any reward will be enough to make like interest to learn interesting things. I, I don't fully buy this uh, argument, but I do think that if you do want something like that to happen, if you want a sufficiently complex environment, a big part of that is having other agents in your environment, right? Um, so I, I'm happy to see there's lots of multi-agent reinforcement learning work. I don't know the details of what's really going on. You can see there's quite a bit of a mix, but uh, it's interesting to see that that's, that's quite a big topic at ICLR. Ah, uh, so here we go. Uh, human level Atari 200 times faster. I did, I think I saw this on Reddit. Uh, so <laughs> I love it. I love it. We propose an RL agent meme that achieves human level performance on all 57 Atari games with 390 million frames, blah, blah, blah. Um, so if you've seen Agent 57, this was like the previous, or one of the previous works that did really well uh, on Atari. So this is essentially just, you know, how can we speed it up 
um, what what you know matters in, in making these things more efficient. So that might be uh, interesting if you're curious what they're doing over there. Ah, this is a cat. This is a catchy title. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm starting the second thing this video. I'm just trying to find catchy titles at this point, but we'll see how it turns out. Maybe you guys can let me know in the comments if, if you like this sort of thing. I, I could do this, you know, whenever we have the big conferences, but we'll see. Uh, so does zero shot reinforcement learning exist? Now, without having read anything about this paper, <laughs> I can let me kind of explain why this title catches my eye. It's because it's because the idea that I think so I'm not sure how much we should expect to actually be possible when we're trying to do efficient learning. For example, let, let's take like a very simple grid world. And you see these grid worlds like all the time, right? They're, they're very simple environments. And now let's say we want an agent to be able to generalize. So let's say we put, uh, you know, we, we let the agent train in this environment. Then we put a purple shift, like a color shift over that grid world. And now we have the agent try and learn again. Um, and both these times, you know, we just do this twice. And then on the third time, we say, now, can we have an algorithm that once we do this a third time, maybe now we have a green filter, the agent learns to adapt immediately and do zero shot learning in that sense. And I think the answer, um, this this is like kind of an extreme example where we only have two cases before the, the one shot example. But of course, they can train as much as they want in the first two environments, the normal environment and the purple shifted environment. But if you think about it, even if we do that, the agent doesn't have, like if the agent doesn't have an idea of different colors and like, uh, you know, uh, some sort of prior bias for like what colors are similar or the fact that different things can be in different shades of colors, we, we shouldn't actually expect something like that to work. And I think where the boundary of what we should expect is possible and what we should be aiming for isn't, isn't exactly clear for me. I'm, I'm sure we haven't reached the limit of what's possible, but uh, that, that's why this caught my eye. So we revisit zero shot RL based on successor representations. Okay, essentially successor representations are an expectation of the features you expect to see uh, in the future. And you can use those to essentially quickly create new value functions and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool, pretty neat idea. Uh, so we introduced improved losses and new models and evaluate them systematically on the unsupervised RL benchmark. I don't see how that matches the title. Let me read into this a bit more. Okay, so th this makes sense to me now. As I just mentioned, successor features, and I just read the abstract, successor features are essentially a way to construct value functions. You already have the expectation of the features, right? And if you already have learned that for an environment, well then to figure out the value function, um, then all you need is an estimation of the reward function, which is a lot easier to learn. In, in other words, you're essentially learning a large part of what you need to know, such that you can transfer your learning to different reward functions, right? So it's essentially saying if you learn successor features uh, or successor representations, you can then use those to do a sort of zero shot RL. Not really zero shot, it would be few shot. I don't think zero shot's probably accurate, but I haven't read the paper. Uh, this, this is interesting just because I like successor uh, representations and I also like intrinsic reward and I like zero shot RL. This is going to make it onto my papers to read or at least look into a bit more later list. Mm, looks like we have a paper about using language and instructions to learn how to do robotics tasks. This has been pretty popular recently. Is this one of the, let me check really quick. I wonder if this is one of the papers that came out from Google recently, because um, it certainly sounds familiar or, or maybe not. This has been gaining a lot of popularity recently, right? And I, I think I had a lot of interest in this and I still do in the last couple of years, now that we have like a, a really good baseline for NLP models, we can kind of start combining those uh, to, to get more out of them in terms of like real world robotics and, and or not even real world robotics, but just telling agents to do stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this recently. Maybe if I can remember what it is, I'll, I'll post a picture on screen, but there's this startup that's doing essentially instruction based, like there's like a Google Chrome extension, I think, where you can have the agent, you know, you tell it what you want to do and it will fill out a spreadsheet or do whatever. Very interesting stuff. I'm excited to see that gaining a lot of traction. Oh, auxiliary task discovery through generate and test. This catches my eye because I'm like 99% sure this is from my university. <laughs> I've never, I've never heard of this paper, but this is, this is, sounds exactly like the type of thing that someone from my school would try and publish. So let, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to take a little closer look real quick. Okay, so I actually did take a little bit of a deeper look at this paper. I'm um, just looking over it. The, the idea here seems very simple, but it is something I, I have been wanting to see more. I have been wanting to see more of, which is essentially uh, they're, they're generating subtasks, right? So subtasks can be useful in reinforcement learning because they can help the model learn a better representation, which then when you go to the main task, 
could potentially help you be more data efficient, right? Um, so it looks like they're just generating different auxiliary tasks. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. And then they have a method, which I haven't written this, but they have a method for evaluating how useful these auxiliary tasks are. So then they keep the ones that are useful and uh, throw away the ones that aren't. So they're essentially meta learning or, or you just learning uh, which ones are good, which can, is a, I guess, overall a form of meta learning. So this is, this sounds interesting. This is definitely making it onto my reading list. Looks like we've also got some options works. I'm not gonna look too much deeper into this one, but options is another area I'm interested in. That's essentially learning instead of taking like these very small, like mini your actions learning more like uh, maybe either policies or, or ways of taking more extended temporally extended uh, sets of actions or sequences of actions um, an, an interesting thing so I'm happy to see there's some work there that doesn't surprise me that there is though intrinsic motivation via surprise memory so intrinsic motivation via surprise was like uh, not that exact name but there that was essentially a similar paper uh, or a paper about a similar idea so it I think really got a lot of people interested in intrinsic motivation in RL. So it's interesting to see that people are still working on something on like a similar thread. So intrinsic motivation emerges through measuring surprise um, as retrieval errors of a memory network. Okay, interesting. So there's a little twist on it, right? So instead of being the surprise of what it sees, if it can't predict what it sees, not that, but saying like if it can't, yeah, retrieve things correctly from its memory. So that, that, that's interesting. I, I wonder how that affects it. Oh, towards biological. Oh, oh no, where'd that go? Towards biologically plausible dreaming and planning. I do tend to like looking at these uh, biologically inspired methods. I will say lots of the times I think the uh, actual usefulness of them is is limited because the problem they're going after is something that's like biologically plausible, which is you know, it's interesting to try and figure out, to figure out how humans might do things, but there's no reason to think that humans do things in the best way possible, especially considering like, you know, we work on a different medium. We, we work on, uh, you know, bio stuff, well as computers work on silicon. But anyway, let, let's see. Dang, again, there's no TLDR. That's so sad. Um, well, I'll take a short look through the abstract. Okay, so this is about what I would expect, right? It's essentially as you're learning online, you also learn a model of the world. And then from there, you use that model to do planning, which uh, neural network, which is quote unquote dreaming. Yeah, I mean, they, I I guess maybe the way they do it is different from standard stuff, but there's, you know, that's, that, that is pretty par for the core in terms of just like, yeah, I, I don't know why they're calling it dreaming and planning. That just sounds like, planning. <laughs> uh, but maybe maybe there's more to it. I haven't read it. Uh, so this is also going to go into my reading list. All right. Now, I, I've been trying to find some papers I heard about, but man, I feel like we have looked at plenty of RL stuff and I don't want to keep boring you all. So we're going to move on. We're going to move on to the next cluster, which is this brown one. What's this? This is Fed average. What is that? On convergence of federated averaging Lang, Lang, that's definitely a math word, right? That's someone's like last name, <laughs> dynamics. Um, digest, finding decentralized learning with local updates. Uh, what is this? Smart multi-tenant federated learning. Interesting. I've never heard of this term before. So I'm going to do a little bit of Googling right now and try and figure out what this is. Federated learning. Maybe I'll learn something new and interesting. This is actually kind of why I wanted to do this. I thought maybe there's some topics that I don't know a whole lot about. And of course, you know, obviously there are. Uh, it works like this. <laughs> your device downloads the current model, improves it by learning from data on your phone, and then summarizes the changes as a small focused update. Ah, and then this update is sent back to the cloud using encrypted communication. Um, where it's immediately averaged. Okay, so the idea, and, and this makes sense based on the name, right, I guess, is you have a bunch of different devices doing their own sorts of updates, and then you have to find a way to come back and, you know, sort of merge those updates or do them all uh, or make use of them. So that, that's interesting. So there's quite a bit of stuff on federated learning. Wow, I, I didn't realize this was such a, um, a big topic. I wonder if it's bigger this year than in previous years. There also is uh, this same person posted a map of ICLR uh, 2018 to 20. 23. It, would, it might be interesting to see what's changed over the years. If that's a video you're interested in, do let me know. Okay, down to the next little cluster here. We have what is this DP mechanism. So this is differentially private. Is that what that stands for? Easy differentially private linear regression. Yeah, okay. So we're going to do again some Googling, but I'm guessing that this means that you can't essentially maybe reverse engineer what the inputs were. So you're like keeping everything, you know, quote unquote private in the network. Yeah, so a system for publicly sharing information about a data set by describing the patterns or groups while withholding the information about individuals. Interesting. Okay, I, this is, again, I, I'm very much not up to date on the whole uh, what's going on in, in this area. So 
interesting to see. What, what are these other little colors that are over here? Triggers, final answer, um, binding language models and symbolic languages. I wonder how that's related. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, let's keep moving on. We have another cluster out here. What's this? This is about backdoor poisoning attacks. Interesting. Uh, another keyword, poisoning attack. What is a poisoning attack? I have never heard of this before. <laughs> uh, adversarial examples. So triggers is, I guess, sort of like some sort of adversarial or just attacks on neural networks. Attacking multi-label models with poisoned labels only. So I'm guessing poison means it, it's intended to, to hurt the model. Um, I'm not going to look this one up, but that's that's my guess. Okay, so so this is sort of about trying to uh, maybe fight against that or how to do it. What's, what's this yellow cluster? Next, we have training AT. What is AT? Oh, adversarial training. I see. Adversarial training. Okay. Um, so this is this is something I think. Um, so I guess maybe, maybe, hopefully I'm getting this right. I guess like a GAN would be an example of adversarial training where you have two networks uh, or more essentially competing against each other. And then they, yeah, so this also has things like adversarial robustness. So this would be trying to, or, or perhaps we're talking about uh, training networks where you're trying to exploit the network. Um, and this is trying to be robust against that. I guess that would be my takeaway. I'm I'm a bit surprised, honestly, by how much research there is in this area. I thought this was a little bit of a smaller area. I know it had like a definitely a huge with like a couple years ago, a huge boost in popularity. Um, I'm surprised to see it still. It looks like it's still going pretty strong. Okay, we have a little orange cluster down here. Yeah, no. So so this looks like it's mostly continual learning stuff. And I will say, I actually I have a big interest in continual learning mainly because I think if you want to do continual learning in like the right way, it requires you to do meta learning, right? The idea being that as you are continuously progressing throughout your task, you want to take what you've learned previously to help you learn what you've learned better in the future. Um, and continual learning, I, I honestly used to think the idea of it was super boring. Um, but when you actually, I think, dive into the, the details of what you need to do to do good continual learning, um, the, the problem is actually becomes quite an interesting one. So let's, let's take a look through a couple of these. So this uh, one thing I'll point out, multivariate Gaussian representation of previous tasks for continual learning. Uh, this this is uh, one sort of framework you can do continual learning in, right? Where you have a bunch of tasks and you essentially go from task to task. And every time you change tasks, you want to maybe uh, reset your network or change it in some way. I'm actually not a huge fan of this not the the work this work itself. I, I know nothing about this, <laughs> but the actual problem setting where you have where you separate your problem into separate tasks. Because if you're working in most real world scenarios, there's usually not a nice gradient of task, or you, you usually get a gradient of tasks, right? It's usually not such a clean switch. So I wonder if we're going to find any papers uh, that that work on that problem. Got some hyper trans hyper transformers. We had transformers, and now we have hyper transformers. Oh boy, <laughs> let's keep let's keep looking. Continue learning via adaptive neuron selection. I wonder what this is about. Paper presents a novel continue learning solution with adaptive neurons. Okay, that doesn't tell me much. Let's read a little bit more. Interesting. So just reading this, um, they, they don't really explain what adaptive neural neuron selection is, but I can kind of guess based on, on what they're saying. Uh, so I think this is essentially the idea is as you go through different tasks, you're going to learn different things to do each task, right? And some neurons will hold yes yeah, so what, what do they say here it's like uh use neurons in earlier tasks as a pool it makes it scalable via reinforcement learning with a small margin i don't know exactly what that means but i guess the idea is that you essentially have this pool of neurons that you've learned that have learned many things so maybe as we adjust or tasks change we need to figure out which ones to use for which tasks or in which scenarios the idea definitely does sound interesting. I'm going to add this one to my to read list and just keeping it going here. I, I don't think there's not too many continual learning here. I know there actually are some more continual learning papers in the uh, RL domain, but I don't see them here. Uh, I wonder if they were more down towards the RL section. Well, we can always go back if we want to later. Let's keep moving on. So let, let's get a, how far have we gone so far? So I think we started up here. Yeah, we started at GNN. No, we started at protein sequences and we've kind of come down and we've gone sort of around here. You know, I think we need to go a bit faster. So I'm going to try and start picking up the pace here. So let, let's keep going. Um, treatment effect. Uh, so this is more stat stuff. Cool. Not going to look at that. <laughs> DG algorithms. Uh, what are DG? Is, what are DG algorithms? Is this like domain generalization? Point cloud? Was it domain adaptation? I'm seeing a lot of domain adaptation here. Um, so, so that's cool. I guess that's, you know, adapting to new domains would be like a new environment in an RL case or, or in other cases, just at like slightly different problem, perhaps. 
Uh, so keep on going on label correction, label correction. So this can be like, I guess, correcting wrong labels. If I'm, if I'm just taking a guess, not super interested in that. Not that it's a, an important problem, but no. Okay. So we got some fairness constraints. I guess we don't have like a super good cluster up here. There's a lot of mixed stuff. I wonder what's going on here. So final answer. What does that mean? Teaching algorithmic reasoning in context via in context learning. So lots of this is like language model stuff, I think, right? Yeah, so here we have like chain of thought, chain of thoughts when you like have in like a language model, uh, when it outputs an action, part of the action, like one of the actions it can be, can be uh, sort of like doing this thing on a notepad where, where it can iterate on its answer. Um, maybe that's what this is referring to. So focus on the hmm, mathematical reasoning, language models. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of uh, chain of thought or like multi-step uh, reasoning going on in this sort of thing. Maybe that's why they're talking about final answer because there's, you know, also non-final answers, which would be like the chain of thought. I'm not entirely sure. This this area actually does interest me, but for the sake of time, I mean, it's, let's say keep going. So I guess this giant cluster up here is lots of natural language stuff. I want to say I'm surprised it's not bigger, but on the other hand, I bet there's also a, I bet there's also natural language stuff somewhere else. I've covered a whole lot of natural language stuff on this channel though. So I don't feel like a, a super big urge to go into this right now. I, I already I'm I'm I think I'm pretty familiar with what's going on. Um, let's see, visual reasoning, visual questions. So now we're getting into visual stuff. Okay, um, so linearly mapping from image to text space. Okay, cool. So I wonder if around here is where we're gonna start to see like the image to video story of uh, stuff. You know, Facebook had their paper on that recently that's been popping off. Personalizing text to image generation using textual inversion. I know textual inversion has been very popular recently. And it's essentially, I'm pretty sure it's this idea that you want, uh, maybe your model for the image doesn't have like a certain idea, right? Like maybe it wasn't trained on any Star Wars data, but you want to put Obi-Wan Kenobi into your model. How can you do that with just a few samples? Oh wait, an image is worth one word. I think this paper got pretty popular, didn't it? I think it got pretty popular already, uh, even before publication. I'm pretty sure I've heard of this. Uh, visually augmented language modeling. Okay, so this is like the this area right here is like visual text multimodal stuff. If we go up to this gray area, we get just video. I see. Here we have just video. So general video recognition with web textual knowledge and then that sort of thing. Okay, so where's where's video generation? That's that's my question. Now we also have a little cluster out here. What's this? Self supervised. So I'm I'm very much a fan of self supervised learning. I think it's gonna play a big role in just learning things. There's, you know, as it turns out, you there's a lot you can learn, um, even when you don't know what you should be learning, but just in terms of learning representations, how to represent things more efficiently. Um, and it looks like what that's kind of what this paper is going for. What do we maximize in self-supervised learning? Um, and how does generalization emerge? I'm very interested in papers like this that kind of explain or try and argue for maybe different perspectives. Uh, this is, you know, I think there's other ways to look at machine learning other than like, this is, this is a very popular way of looking at it nowadays, right? Like, what do we maximize? That's like sort of the goal. It's you want a good architecture and you want to be optimizing the right objective. Um, I think there's other ways to look at this, but I am very curious what, what they say, uh, what, what they think is the best thing to maximize. So, per, so perhaps I will add this to my reading list. Uh, what else do they have over here? Information maximization. Okay, sustainable self-supervised learning, low compute, uh, the low compute area. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. So let's now move over here. What is this? Scene reconstruction. Okay. So scene reconstruction is, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? <laughs> you have a 3D scene and, and you want to uh, sort of reconstruct it. So there's like learning representations in 3D uh, and, and that sort of thing. So this, I'm actually, there's actually quite a bit of stuff going on here. I haven't looked into this part of the literature very much. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> How do we just get the topic something, something? How did that happen? What, what? Anyway, let's, let's move on. Point conformer, revenge of the point-based convolution. Oh God. Uh, oh gosh. Yeah. So I guess point-based representations are like the ones where you represent a 3D world as like a, a series of points instead of like 3D models are generally represented as a set of triangles, right? And then you render those triangles and you get a 3D model. So I guess uh, maybe, maybe the point stuff is more popular or not. I guess it says revenge. Maybe it's not as popular. <laughs> uh, capturing the motion of every joint. So this is like human pose stuff. I've actually used human pose stuff before to create like a dance game where it tracks your poses. That's fun. I'm sure other people have done that too. It's like a certain hackathon project. <laughs> Dynamic ball query. Okay. So lots of scene 
Lots of like scene video stuff. What's up here? Background noise. So I guess is this trying to get rid of background noise or recover it? Filter recovery for multi-speaker audio visual speech segmentation. Okay, so this is background noise and not in terms of like uh, it's a literal noise, like the audio noise. Okay, that makes more sense. That's not what I was thinking. <laughs> Ultra realistic singing voice generation via stochastic differential equations. Ultra realistic singing voice. Wow. Uh, and then speech. So this is like mostly it sounds more like speech synthesis um, or like audio synthesis more than anything else. Uh, there's, I'm going to say there's actually less of this than I would expect. I would have expected audio stuff to be a bit more popular right now, but I guess video and image and text kind of take it everything over. So maybe I shouldn't expect that much. <laughs> Down here we have generative average serial networks. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not interested at all in, in GANs. I think they're, um, I, <laughs> I've never had a super big interest, especially now that we have better performing models for most tasks. Um, let's see. So we have diffusion models. Wow, diffusion models are not as many as I would expect, to be honest, with how like popular diffusion models have been recently. Let's see, modeling tabular data with diffusion models. Okay, not, okay. Uh, yeah, if you haven't, you know, seen what diffusion models are, I guess, are you living under a rock? But also, uh, just a quick <laughs> overview, it's the, essentially the idea that you can make a really good generative model by taking a bunch of images noising them, adding noise to the image, and then trying to um, iteratively undo those noise steps. And, and that sort of, uh, those types of models give you a really good uh, generative model, or that type of process gives you a very good general, uh, generative model. And if you're more interested in that, check out like my stable diffusion video or something. Um, hmm. So I guess people are still working on just ways to improve this, but also applications. So it's good to see. Yeah, I, I'm honestly expecting that we'll see more and more diffusion modeling stuff, just because in terms of generative models as a whole, diffusion models seem to be one of the uh, best ways to do this right now, at least for continuous non-structured data, like, you know, images. Um, I just saw there was also a medical imaging one in here. That doesn't surprise me at all. I would imagine that that sort of stuff will get more and more popular until uh, we find a better way to do generative models, which as of right now, I'm not sure exists, at least not that I'm aware of. Okay, out of distribution. Oh, oh, this is this is a very small cluster for something I'm very interested in now. Um, so out of distribution, I'm guessing this is, out of distribution means like, right, if you're training on something, uh, you might have samples that are not in your original training distribution, but you wanna do well in them too. So meta-learning for unsupervised outlier detection. Okay, so that's just detection. Uh, so this is anomaly detection. Oh, okay, so maybe this isn't just is out of distribution detection, uh, which is right. That's what anomaly detection is. So if you have maybe a bunch of like, you know, I've actually done this as when I was working as a machine learning engineer, I was actually doing some of this where you have maybe a bunch of data from a machine and you want to figure out when it's malfunctioning. Well, you can try and figure out what's like out of distribution and what's out of the norm. Uh, so there's a little bit on that. Um, we have some time series stuff, you know, uh, I mean, of course, you're always going to have time series stuff. So of course, all the time series stuff is now um, transformers, continue learning with feed forward adaptation. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, I guess just what you'd expect of time series stuff. <laughs> Pretty standard. Okay. So, so it looks like we kind of went around the board here. I guess we also have some graph neural network stuff. There's a lot of work on graph neural networks when you look at this. Wow. I actually don't really know what's going on in graph neural networks at all. I guess, is this more application or trying to improve graph neural networks? I guess it's probably a mix, right? It looks like just going over this there's quite a mix of things people are using GNNs for. And I guess we, you know, maybe maybe that's not surprising given like how many things can naturally be represented as graphs. Um, and the general idea here, right, is just you want to be able to use neural networks on graphical data. Um, and, and that's what this is all about. What's what's next to this, KG? Okay, so, so anyway, uh, we've gone over quite a bit now. I think we've gone over the outer rim of this entire thing. So I wanna do two or three things to, before we, you know, sort of kind of wrap up the video of uh, one is check out a little bit of this intersection. It looks like there's a lot more overlap here. And I think I'm going to do more of a speed round for this intersection. I'm kind of curious to look at like, what are the biggest topics? We've gone over a lot of stuff here. What are the biggest topics? It looks like one is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is really big, which I'm very happy to see. Reinforcement learning is actually a lot bigger than I thought. I think one of the reasons um, there's like a recently a post on Reddit about how RL hasn't had much progress in the past few years. 
um, which I'm not sure I entirely agree with, but I definitely see where they're coming from when you compare it with something like, you know, image generation or text generation. Definitely, we're not seeing the same success in our L, even though you can see there's a lot of work in it. So why might that be? I think one reason is one thing you'll notice, even though this is our RL stuff, it's like lots of different clusters in here, right? You can see there's lots of different colors. RL is a very like, there's a lot of stuff happening in the field. Um, and I think that's partially because it's just a bigger problem. RL is like a very general problem of like maximizing reward is something that can be done in so many different settings in so many different ways. Um, whereas some of the textual stuff, I mean, sure, there's lots of different ways you can go about doing tech stuff, but at the end of the day, it's it's one problem. It's like we want to be able to, eh, maybe that's not entirely true because I guess you have question answering and you have like logic-based stuff and you have all this. Um, but it is, I think, more confined in the sense that all of that is being done in one way, and that's like uh, uh, this self-supervised language modeling. But reinforcement learning looks to be really big. What was this red stuff over here? Protein sequencing, bigger than I expected. Um, GNN seem, seem to also be very popular right now. What else was there over here? And I should say, just disclaimer, right? This is papers that were submitted to iClear, and iClear is a, what is it, International Conference for Learning Representations, I, I want to say. So these papers are going to be focused towards that. But within that general category, I am kind of curious as to what's popular. It looks like adversarial training is also more popular than I expected, really. Um, we also have language models are just as popular as I expected. That's no surprise. Um, and you can see that there's starting to be a lot more uh, vision stuff. I guess I'm surprised there's not more diffusion model stuff, but perhaps it's because they're still relatively new. Um, and this is, you know, uh, it takes so much time to write a paper. But yeah, it's a interesting, interesting mix of things that are popular. So there's, there's also a good bit of continual learning stuff, which I'm happy to see. So let's now, before we before we wrap this up, we still have a lot to go over in the middle. I'm just going to do a quick run through and then I'm going to maybe search for a few papers I saw earlier that I want to briefly mention that I thought were cool. So starting with this red cluster over here, we have adaptive gradient. So this is sort of gradient descent stuff, I guess. Um, interesting, uh, though, honestly, you know, I think what we have now works pretty well. Not that we can't do better, but there's there's so many papers about various different ways of doing gradient descent and back propagation. Um, and I think on the whole, there was a recent paper that showed that really none of them match up to just good old Adam or RMS prop, uh, like at least consistently. So what else do we have? Really networks. Hmm. I'm curious that this is like, why this is in its own category with the keywords here, convex optimization, gradient descent. Okay. So this is still very much like how to do gradient descent stuff, gradient flow. I think you have all probably noticed if you watch this point, these clusters are not perfect, right? They're, they're AI generated. So, um, you know, there's going to be some issues. Uh, NERT, NERT networks, SNN, spiking neural networks. Oh, okay. So spiking neural networks are like a biological, it's how biological neural networks work. So there is a bit of work trying to reproduce like biologically plausible uh, neural networks. And it looks like that's what's going on over here. So we see <laughs> trying to recreate transformers uh, in the spiking neural network uh, area. That, that's interesting. I wonder how, how that went. Um, hmm, Event-based classification with them. Uh, sparsity. Sparsity is one area that I think is very interesting. I'm a little bit surprised and sad we haven't seen more, but maybe we just haven't gotten there yet. So let's keep looking. Sparsity, I, I think is going to, oh, oh, filter printing. Hold on. We might've just made it there. Optimal data flow and binary, binary neural networks. Oh, huh, I haven't heard of those before. That's not interesting. What is a binary neural network? Can significantly accelerate the inference time of neural networks by replacing its expensive floating point arithmetic with bitwise operations. Huh? This is very interesting. I've never heard of this before, but I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, right? Of course, you know, people are trying to go from like 32 bit to 16 bit to eight, bit. of course, someone's doing one bit. <laughs> uh, this is going to go on my reading list just because I haven't heard of this before. And I'm curious what's going on with uh, b and I guess they're called. Um, interesting. It's definitely sparse in a sense. <laughs> um, let's see. So efficient deep learning. Uh, model compression. So, so I guess this green area, what's, oh, there's some more filter pruning down here. Um, so structured pruning. Okay. So pruning is like you try and figure out what connections in your neural network are not needed and you prune them and you can actually get much, much more efficient neural networks by, by pruning, right? I think in lots of neural networks you can prune. I, I don't know the exact number, so don't quote me on this, but over 50% of, of connections, probably even more and still have very similar performance. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm interested in sparsity, right? Uh, it seems like there's no reason that networks should have to have this layer by layer structure other than it makes the, the hardware and the computation much easier. Uh, but I do think, you know, I, I'm 
I mean, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I, I have a feeling that eventually we're going to break out of that that way of doing things, especially once maybe hardware adjusts. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm far from an expert on this, but it looks like that's what's going on here. Honestly, if I wasn't running out of time, I would want to look a little bit more into this because it looks like there's a, a decent bit going on on sparsity and pruning. Uh, so, th so that's really good to see. It's really good to see. So what do we have over here? We have meta learning. Ah, here's some meta learning. I, I wanted to see meta learning. Oh, wait, there's just, wait, no, there's just one meta learning. <laughs> So continue learning stuff. Yeah, so it's quite a mix in the middle here. Neural collapse. I guess this is where uh, yeah, maybe stuff that didn't really fit in anywhere else, or it's a combination of multiple things, perhaps. Unlearn and relearn an online paradigm for deep neural networks. Okay, so there's some more online learning stuff going on over here. Maybe scroll out will be easier. Um, Self-supervised learning. Oh, okay. So we had some self-supervised learning, I think, up here, right? And then we have another cluster down here which maybe these are two different types of self-supervised learning, which would make sense, right? Self-supervised learning is a whole field. So here, let's see, we have some contrastive learning, contrastive learning. Okay, so this is more like contrastive learning um, sort of stuff going on here. And the idea between contrastive learning is essentially um, you're learning by uh, the differences between different, like what are generally called like positive samples and negative samples. So if uh, you want, generally like one way to do this would be to maybe take two images and then you say these images should be similar. The representation should be similar to images that are just slightly, like if we add some slight noise, not much has changed. So those should be similar when you compare them to like completely different images, right? There's a lot of yellow up here. I wonder what all this is. Hmm, VIT models. Ah, uh, VIT, I believe stands for vision transformer. So this is uh, a type of, yeah, as it says, transformer. Uh, for your vision-based tasks, where you essentially take an image and you split it up into tokens, and those tokens can be fed to your transformer, and I have already, it works pretty well. This is like contrastive learning, vision stuff up here. Yeah, so it looks like all this is like a mix of vision stuff, contrastive learning, um, and stuff in that general domain. I think we just went, I got through most of the stuff. Now, a, a few things I want to talk about. Um, one, oh man, I can't, there we go. One, <laughs> we didn't go through every paper. Uh, two, I, I, you know, we just went over titles and abstracts. So I hope you all aren't taking this to be like a very specific thing. Now, there actually were a couple papers I did see before this that I, I kind of wanted to talk about, not too much. Um, just while I had been browsing like on Unread and stuff, uh, there was like this fully online meta learning. Um, this was this was kind of cool. Essentially, be, I, I mentioned right. I, I like uh, online learning or continual learning, and I also like meta learning. Um, so so this was a neat little paper. I, I found that didn't pop up in this. Um, it's somewhere, but you know, I just didn't get to it. There's also like, what was this? I, I haven't read through these papers fully, but also, they, you know, they sound cool. Meta learning, the inductive biases, uh, simple neural circuits. There, there was a lot of cool stuff. It, it was neat to do this. This is my first time going through before submissions are actually peer reviewed and like, you know, accepted or rejected. Um, so, so there's quite a bit here. One thing I want to ask all of you, uh, people that are still somehow watching after all of this, um, do you find this interesting, uh, <laughs> going through like this, just looking over titles and abstracts and, and seeing kind of what's out there. Normally on my channel, you know, I do a lot of, we read this paper, we, I, I explain this paper. Um, this was more of just, let's have a little bit of fun, see what's out there. Um, and there's really not, you know, not a very serious video. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, do consider subscribing. I really do appreciate it. Also consider you know, following me on Twitter if you want to see some updates from me. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.